in the context of the world, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Right, here's East Central Europe today. Slovakia, Poland, Ukraine, Romania, and Hungary. And here's the Carpathian mountain chain. And look, right along the Carpathian mountain chain, all the gray is Rusin ethnographic territory. So Rusins come from southern Poland, a region called the Lemko region. Um, and Rusins from that area sometimes identify themselves as Lemkos. That would be a future program on Lemkos in the greater Youngstown, Moore, and Sharon area. Eastern Slovakia, this whole territory from Spish County, Spish, Shadish, Zemlin, Abo, Kurnia counties, this area is called by the Rusins, the Ashevska Rus, or the Freshov Rusin territory. Then this great big piece here, which is actually where the most Rusins are, is known as Subcarpathian Rus. This is today the Transcarpathian Oblast in what is today in Ukraine. You see down here a bunch of Rusins in Romania, individual Rusin villages in Hungary as well. So Rusins come from these five states. For most of their history, identifying as Rusin wasn't anything that they would jumble about. If you were confused about your Rusin heritage, and um, you said, well, I guess Bubba was confused too. Bubba wasn't confused at all, not at all. When Bubba came to America, if you asked Bubba what she was, she would say, Yadusnachka or in with the Yadusnak. They knew clearly what they were, and in this world, everybody knew what that was too. It was only when they got here and the other national or other governments, foreign governments, here in the United States were playing them off against one another to achieve goals in Europe. That's a future lecture too. But the confusion only happened here. It that they knew quite well. And when they got here, Slovaks knew who their Russian neighbors were as the Russians. And the Rusnaks knew who their Slovak neighbors were, as the Rusnaks called them, Slovaks. Okay. So this is where they come from. Well, you can see there's this great big overlap here, because these people directly south of these Rusnaks, guess who they are? Slovaks. Who they lived alongside of. And we like, you know, in America, we like things to be in boxes. We like to say, you know, this is Rusin, this is Slovak. This is Polish, but the world ain't that way. And especially in Eastern Europe. If you get down here, see Koshitsev, Demisha, Mihalovtsev, I call that in the Russian world the Bermuda Triangle. Mm -hmm. I call it that for a reason. That territory was so ethnically mixed before our people came here that it would, if you came from that part of the world, it's not uncommon to come from Trebisho and you're a Russian living in this house. Right across the street from you are Slovaks. Next to them are Hungarians, behind them a Jewish family, the gypsies are here, and Germans are to your left. And you all live in the same neighborhood. So this business about, oh, well, you know what, I, mean, I came from this side of the line, therefore, when you get to some of these ethnically mixed neighborhoods, forget it. It doesn't work. And it especially doesn't work in Eastern Europe, where the boundary of the country and the ethnic boundary of the people has never, and still yet today, is not the same. So if you go to Slovakia, Slovakia is a country of five million people, and only three and a half million of them are Slovaks. You know what I said? Okay? If you take the Rusins, of which there are estimated 120,000, the 800,000 to perhaps as much as a million Hungarians, the Jews, the Romani, the Gypsy, more than 200,000 Romani that is estimated to be there, the Czechs who live there. And here's the other thing, ladies and gentlemen, today. You live in America, right? You live in a place like Warren, and you've got 20 different ethnic groups in this town, don't you? Guess what? In Slovakia today, same thing. You know, you can go to the woman who takes care of you in a hotel in Dresho in Slovakia, and she says, her last name is Majerova. You know what that means? Meyer is her last name. So are you a She says, no, I'm a German. You know, that's the way the world is with immigrant populations. But let's start with where Slovaks and Russians come from, because from the very beginning, we are different. This is a map of East Central Europe in the 600s, okay? Now, one of the things you have to understand as we talk about this, and it's really important, start looking at those names. Part of what makes it difficult to understand nationalities is we have this idea that God created Adam and Eve, then Cain and Abel, 
and then Slovaks, Croatians, Poles, Italians, Greeks. The people have always been what they are today. And this is crazy, because what it was is people were tribal, and certain groups came together to form nationalities. Other groups broke apart to form different nationalities. So here's in the 600s, ladies and gentlemen, most of you are from Eastern Europe. Raise your hand. Tell me the last time you met one of those Bolivians. Anybody who? <laughs> Okay? Or how about a Polanyan, or a Mazovian, or a Derevianian, or a Galician? Get the picture? Today, many of these tribes are Russians, many of these tribes are Ukrainians, they're tribes that came together. So where's the Slovaks and the Russians here? Well, the Slovaks, you can see, here they are. And where do they live? Here's the Danube River in western Slovakia. Okay? Here's eastern Slovakia, right here. Here's the Rusins, white Croats. Um, Croat meaning Horvat, Horvat coming from Hori, mountain dwellers. White because they live up north as opposed to black Croats who live down south. Okay? So these are a West Slavic tribe, who by the way, the Slavs word for themselves at this time is not Slovak but Slovenian, people of the world. Okay? So the Slovaks are Slovenian, the Rusins are white Croats. These are West Slavs, these are East Slavs. Ah, already, one difference. Let's show that a little more graphically. Here's Eastern Europe in contemporary times. Everything orange is West Slav. What's a West Slav? Their languages are grouped together. They're structured similarly. They speak similar types of languages. Everything pink is an East Slav. Same thing, their languages are clustered together. They are more similar than they are different. So here we have West Slavs, Czechs, Lusatian Swords, Poles, Slovaks. They're all orange. East Slavs, Russians who are so far away, they're off the map. Belarusians, Ukrainians, and Carpathians. So Slovaks speak a West Slavic language. Rusins speak an East Slavic language. Now, if you speak either of those languages and you grew up in Eastern Ohio or the Sharon area, you're going to say to me, but John, my next door, we were Rusins and my next door neighbors were Slovaks and we understood that. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for two reasons. One, they were still Slavic languages. So, for instance, there's a third group of Slavs. You know them called the Yugo Slavs, the Croats, the Serbians. I speak Rusin. The Serbian speaks a South Slavic language. I can still understand and we can understand maybe. But more importantly, why would you as a Rusin be able to understand a Slovak? Because you came from the same place. So your languages infected and influenced one another. Um, the reality of this, especially if you are a Slovak and you came from Eastern Slovakia, you speak Slovak dialects so different from standard Slovak that if you went to Western, if you spoke standard literary Slovak, someone spoke standard literary Slovak, you wouldn't know what to do. I use myself as an example. I grew up in a household where my grandfather was Russian. My grandmother was half Russian and half Shadish Slovak. Slovak from Shadish town. So I spoke, actually my first two languages were Russian and Shadish Slovak. Went to kindergarten and the teacher says, you know where this is going, right? Who knows how to count? Uh, and then he goes, I do. Get in my I still remember the look on her face. <laughs> so I, thought, I knew the distinction between these two, but also this Shadish Slovak. 40% of its words come from Rusin, because these are Slovaks who live alongside of these Rusins. Um, so if you're a Slovak, turn to your Rusin neighbor and thank them for bandurke, because without it, the Rusin word for potatoes. Um, and by the way, that's the standard literary reason. Potatoes are so important to us in Russia, we actually have 32 different words for potato, like Eskimos with snow. <laughs> and I'm sure your family, you're going to come to me later and say, no, we use crumbly, no, we use, you know. But the standard Slovak word for potato is zemiaki. It's nothing like bandurki. But I can assure you, if you're a Slovak from this part of the world, you're using that word bandurki. So I go to Pitt and I study slow, standard literary slow on the Pitt. I come home and I say to my grandmother, let's talk. <laughs> so I speak standard literary slow on she turns to me and she goes, that's not slow <laughs> That's Czech. <laughs> I said, no, 
that's Slovak, which you speak is a whole different dialect of things. And for those who are Slovaks, one exactly. of the things that's actually disheartening is this Scottish Slovak dialect, which is so distinctive. Need I tell you this? After four generations of kids going to school, learning standard, standard literary Slovak, what's happening to Scottish Slovak? It's disappearing. There actually, there's actually a group in Peshaw that's trying to say, how can we keep Shadish Slovak alive? Because it's very distinctive. It replaces B's with Ts and T's with Ts. So uh, it's the word Yeti in Slovak becomes Zeti in Shadish Slovak. Okay? Um, so some of you have heard these kinds of things. Now, when did these Rusins and these Slovaks come up against one another? Because you saw on that first map, Billy Wodorati here, Slovaks here, and a great big gap in between them. I don't expect you to read this because it's in Cyrillic. I will translate it for you. Here's the same place. Here's the Danube River. So here's the outline of what is today Slovakia. Okay? So Slovaks here, Rusins were here, and what do we see happen here? Here's Kushara, the capital of the Carpathians. Here's Zeppelin County. And here is Cyrillic, this is Ruska Magda, or the Rusin March. This is Rusin territory. So Rusins have settled down all the way through the Carpathians, all the way down into, if you see this, this is Satmar in Romania. This is all the way down to Romania and Hungary. Then as the Hungarians come, and they settle even further. What happens is over time, the Ottoman Empire pushes the Hungarians up. Guess what that does to everybody else? The Hungarians push everybody else up. So the Russians get driven back further into the mountains. The Slavs are driven back further into the west. And so what you have is this area called Eastern Slovakia, which at this time, this place is called the Russian March. Do you know what that piece called Eastern Slovakia is called? No man's land. There's a reason for that. Because you know who lived there? Nobody. Nobody. Okay? The Hungarians, when they settled them, wanted, uh, they didn't like that great big gap. Because if you leave that great big gap in the mountains, as other Asian groups come through the mountains, they can attack the Hungarians and decimate the Hungarian Empire. So the Hungarians actually give tax benefits to three groups of people to settle Eastern Slovakia. The Slovaks coming from the west, the Rusins coming from the east, and the Germans coming from the west. Okay? So here's 